looks like Chris and Heather might have just joined. Good evening. This is Tim Tapley. Um, hopefully you both can hear me just fine. It's just a few minutes before 7, uh, so we'll get started in a couple of minutes here. Um, if one of you would do me a huge favor, uh, just throw a little message in the chat box. Let me know you can hear me okay. That would be great. Thank you. Hey, Beth, are you able to hear me okay? Um, oh, wait, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I just unmuted you. Oh. oh, you did. Okay, yes, I can hear you very well. I'm like trying okay. to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you're good. And the screen looks good, too. Okay. The only thing I don't know is I can't tell whether I'm it's being recorded or not. Hopefully it, it, it records automatically. When you start the broadcast, do you see the recording button? Um, it's up there with start broadcast, but it, it does, it records automatically, so you're good. Yeah, cool. All right, I'll get started in a couple of minutes. We'll give people a few more minutes to join. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Again, this is Tim Tapley. I'm going to give uh, everyone else about another minute to join, and then we will get started. All right. Well, again, everyone, thanks for attending tonight. Uh, this is Tim Tapley. Um, uh, I'm not sure if we've had a chance to meet in the past, but I'm uh, fortunate enough to have been a QT tour from quite literally the very beginning. Uh, that does two things. It means that, like all of you, I've uh, logged way too many miles, eaten too much applesauce. It also makes me very, very old, unfortunately. But uh, I've also have, I'm not sure I'll call it a privilege, some days it is, some days it's not uh, to be an attorney. Um, and I guess the fortunate part of that is my practice typically involves um, defending people when they get sued. So most of my clients are insurance companies. But it's given me over the almost 20 years quite a perspective uh, on people who get injured in accidents and over the past seven years or so i've been able to transition a component of my practice into helping people a little bit who are and mostly my friends and, and acquaintances who unfortunately get injured involved on their bikes or out running and over the past couple of years i've decided you know what better way to kind of give back to qt2 and give back to the sport than to pass along a little bit of information um, you know, it should anyone ever be in the, the situation where they are involved in an accident. Things to do to do to protect yourself and protect your family and loved ones uh, before an accident ever takes place. And then some strategies uh, around accidents and then kind of knowing some of the rules of the road. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, we've got the chat feature and the question feature both available. If you have any questions, feel free to, to throw them up there. I'll try to keep an eye on the question 
uh, tab and, and uh, to the extent I can. But you've also got my phone number there, and this is recorded and saved. If anyone ever has any questions at all, feel free to email me or call anytime. I'm always there as a resource and as a friend. So, so a couple things. Um, you know, being prepared as we get out on the roads. I mean, going through coronavirus, depending on where everyone is, we've either spent way too much time on Zwift or we've been able to uh, use some very, very empty roads and enjoyed riding kind of in its purest form where, I mean, here in uh, Massachusetts anyway, we went through a couple of weeks where I could ride at seven o'clock in the morning and barely see a car. And it was, you know, if, I won't say there's anything good coming out of the world situation, but that was kind of a nice perk, I guess. Um, but the, the reality is now with things opening up for, for a lot of states, we're all back on the road a lot more and so are all the drivers. You're now, we're now dealing with drivers who are anxious to be back at work, anxious to be out moving around, anxious to be out getting places and doing things. And so the attention to, to, be, to the road, the attention to cyclists and, the, and our safety might not be uh, what we would hope it would be. So that's part of what we're going to talk about again tonight. The first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of rules of the road, okay? It's important that we know really what our rights and our responsibilities are and, um, as riders. Now, the laws I'm going to show you are all based here in Massachusetts. Um, I can't cover every state, obviously, in, in about 45 minutes of presentation or half hour, 45 minutes of presentation, but I can kind of give you a sense of what Massachusetts is like because it's indicative of what a lot of states are like. Um, and certainly, if you have questions about your particular state, shoot me an email. I'm happy to look into it and give you some thoughts. But it's a, Massachusetts is really a, a good primer. So, Almost every state, and in fact, every state I'm aware of, has enacted some statute or law that governs the use of roadways by cyclists, okay? Some states say the cyclists, the same rules apply to cyclists as apply to all moving vehicles on the road. Some states have very specific rules about the interaction between uh, cyclists and automobiles. Some states are so specific, like New Hampshire, for instance, that says this famous three-foot rule that cars can't pass a, a cyclist anywhere closer than three feet, and then the faster you go, the greater the distance is supposed to be. Um, other states have a very sort of a amorphous rule of riders have to stay as far right to the right as they can, and cars are only supposed to pass when safe to do so. So, and most states fall within those two parameters. But knowing the law, knowing uh, and trying to apply the rules when you do ride will help you tremendously if the unfortunate thing happens and you end up, or someone you're with ends up in a traffic accident. The reason behind that is obviously, you know, the rules are there for a reason. We might dispute them, but they are really there for the safety of both cyclists and drivers. And so if we follow the rules the best we can, and believe me, I'm the first one that's in a group ride and I'm hanging on to the front of the ride with a bunch of young kids and my bleeding out of my eyeballs trying to hold on. And if those guys go through a stop sign, I, Nine times out of ten, I'm probably going with them. Is it the right thing to do? Absolutely not. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we need to be cognizant of what's happening. We need to be able to follow the rules because if there is an accident, you know, fast forward from the day of the accident to say there's a lawsuit and say, you, you know, you've been hurt in an accident and you're suing the driver and then you're represented by an attorney and this has to go to a trial and, you're, and your attorney is standing in front of a jury. Well, there's going to be certain people on that jury who have bias against cyclists. And if you are following the rules and you know the rules and you're doing the right thing, well, then that, that is a really good way to combat any bias there might be if you were the one following the rules and the driver was the one that wasn't, okay? Just a real quick example. I know this is long. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But you know, in Massachusetts, again, as an example of what a lot of states, they say that Cyclists actually have a right to use all public ways in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's interesting because most states don't say that a driver of an automobile has a right to use the roadways. It is a, a privilege. It's not a right. In Massachusetts, that right is gifted to cyclists in a way that's different than, than people driving vehicles. Um, but, you know, it does say that we are subject to the traffic rules and regulations with some notable exceptions. You know, for instance, we were all taught in probably like fifth grade what the rules were regarding signaling when you were uh, on a bicycle, you know, holding your hand up, saying you're stopping, using the left hand to signal both left and right hand turns. In some states, you can use either hand. 
But it's interesting to note that we are not only are we supposed to do that, but we're required by law in Massachusetts to do that. I think you'll see a lot of states say uh, virtually the same thing. Um, it also talks about you know the rights when passing motor vehicles and when um, what motor vehicles are supposed to do when they're trying to pass you. You know, so those are the types of things you want to look for in your state. I'm ha certainly happy to help you do that because there's a lot of probably uh, lack of understanding out there. I don't know how many times I've been out on the road, I'm riding two abreast and someone comes up behind us and says, single file, screams out. I'm sure it's happened to all of you as well. Well, um, it happens to me in Massachusetts all the time, but you know, in Massachusetts, cyclists can ride two abreast. By law, they can. The only time you can is if you're on a road where there's two lanes going in the same direction. So like a highway, which unless you're Jesse, you, t you typically avoid riding on roads like that. Um, you know, so it's important to know the rules. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's typically very healthy to flaunt the rules to another driver, but it's important to know a little bit about the rules because I can guarantee you, if you know some of the rules, you're going to know more than the police officers. And if you end up in one of those funny situations where you get pulled over by the police on your, on your bike and the police officer says, well, you're riding two abreast, it's always good to say politely, well, officer, thank you, but, you know, the rule in Massachusetts, wherever you are, is that I can ride, I can ride two abreast. Now, that's not the rule in every state, but it's important to note, uh, it's an important thing to understand, you know, that there's a common misconception that you're always supposed to ride single file. And that just might not be the case where you are, the, the state that you're in. Now, that these rules always are governed by this overarching theme of safety. So, you know, if you're on a, a twisty, turny road with blind corners all over the place, well, riding to a breast obviously might not be the smartest thing to do. Um, most States also have a rule that talks about the, like I said at the beginning, interaction of the vehicles and cyclists when the vehicle is trying to pass. In Massachusetts, the vehicle is only supposed to pass in, in certain situations, but it's important to note that a cyclist is supposed to facilitate the passing of a vehicle from behind when it's safe to do so. You'll see that the, the, that is, uh, that's a law that changes a lot depending on the state that you're in. In many of those states where you say, that like Ohio, for instance, that says you're supposed to ride as near to the right side as practicable. Um, you know, that's sort of an amorphous rule, but at the same time, Ohio has a rule that says you don't have to move out of the way of vehicles that are going faster than you. So again, it's just something that's important to know to have a, a basic understanding of what the rules are, because again, the, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. All right. Um, Another thing for those of you who ride early in the morning before work or late in the afternoon after work, uh, lights have become, uh, you know, I, I ride with lights in front and back every, all day, every day. It doesn't matter what time. Um, but I, I had been riding at night or early in the morning in the dark here in Massachusetts and New Hampshire for years before I really even learned that your lights were required. Um, and I think you'll find in many states that lights are required. Massachusetts, for instance, you got to have lights half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise. I think Pennsylvania, for instance, is sun, sunset to sunrise. You have to have lights. Um, in Massachusetts, you're supposed to have pedal reflectors or reflective gear around your ankles. We, I was on a group ride uh, last fall. Police officer, um, actually, it was a big group ride early in the morning, Friday morning. Police officer from the town where, from which we departed gave us an escort actually through the town going basically as fast as we wanted to go lights on you know to give us an escort on our route through town and this is one of those rides that goes every single day at 5:45, regardless of weather it has been for years so that same police officer was there the next morning when he left and he said or next i should say on monday the next monday when we left and he, he re reminded us that he hoped that we appreciated the ride, the uh, the escort he gave us through town the previous week, but he reminded us that the rule was we were supposed to have uh, reflective um, um, things around our ankles or uh, pedal reflectors, which obviously very few of us had. So it was a, I thought it was a pretty interesting move by the police officer, a great way to get our attention, and a lot of us showed up the next ride with wearing those things because we appreciate what he'd done for us. So anyway, a bit of a seg, excuse me, a bit of an aside, but it's good to know what the rules are. Um, as we get into what to do if you're in an accident uh, going forward, you know, the last thing you want to do is end up in an accident, because uh, obviously, but, you know, one of the, the things a driver is always going to say is, well, I, I couldn't see him. I didn't see him. You know, the, well, if, you're, if you have lights flashing in the front and the back, uh, then that's great. It gives you a great argument. But if he says that he 
the driver says he couldn't see you and you were actually breaking the law because you were riding you know during those those hours that you're supposed to have lights and you didn't have them well you know that it, it almost doesn't matter what happened that's a loser case for you so and it's tough to protect yourself it's tough it's tough to get financial recovery and protection for you and your family if you're the one breaking the rules um, so let's talk a little bit about about accidents okay because you know I've been involved in a couple uh, bike accidents with vehicles um, I know a lot of my friends have hopefully none of you have hopefully none of you ever will but the reality is that they happen and if you ride a lot which QT tours do um, either you know I don't want to say you're going to be in one because that's that's not really the case but you're probably going to know someone who is okay and if we can impart a little bit of knowledge to everybody then it protects all of us right so the key is you know in Massachusetts if you're a cyclist and you're involved in an accident and there's any property damage and above 100 bucks you have to report it to the police department where the accident occurred okay New Hampshire has a rule that says you're supposed to report accidents to the police. We'll talk about insurance in a few minutes, but almost every single one of you has an automobile insurance policy or you're covered by an automobile insurance policy, and that policy will require that if you're in an accident, especially if it's a hit and run, you have to report it to the police. So the rule really is, one of the biggest takeaways from this is, if you're in an accident, it doesn't matter if you're mad, if you're upset, if you don't want to be hurt, if you don't want to even think about the idea that your Ironman training might just have gone up in smoke, and you don't even want to, you don't even want the thought of you being injured to enter into your mind because of what it means for your training and racing and everything else. And so you think you're going to do the tough thing and ride home? Don't do it. Call the police. Make a report. Even if the police can't come out there, the fact that you've called the police, it's recorded, it's there forever. You've got evidence of your on, on, your, on your cell phone. Um, if you're there with someone else and they're in an accident and it's a bad accident and they can't call the police, then call the police for them, okay? Because it, it is creating a record of what transpired. It's creating a record that the accident happened. And as, again, I'm going to keep coming back to this because I've happened to me when I've tried to help other people out. If you're in an accident and it's a hit and run or a car runs you off the road or comes too close and yells at you and then you hit sand and you go down hard and they take off, you got to call the police because that's your evidence of what happened. If you don't call the police right there, then you go home, you wait a couple of days and then you realize you're really banged up and then you go to the hospital and then, you know, it's weeks later that you finally call the police. Well, any, you know, and then you go to make an insurance claim about this. Well, your insurance company is going to say, well, there's no evidence this accident took place because he didn't call the police. Okay. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because I said I would talk about insurance in a bit, but this is all tied together. So again, I'm going to harp on this. If you're in an accident, call the police. It's not so much what the police do or don't do. It's the fact that you've made this report. Okay. Um, Okay, so your accident action strategy. Um, oops, sorry, there we go. Rule number one, and I violate this um, worse than just about anybody, especially when I'm riding with my kids. I took my kids out, well, my daughter, she and I, I agree that she went for a ride with me. We go to Starbucks, uh, so we rode together a couple weeks ago, and then I took my son seven-year-old for a ride down to the pond at the lake in our town last weekend and both times my children learned what it was when dad screamed at a driver and flipped somebody off and of course both of them went back and said mom we saw dad use his middle finger at a car which is awesome um kids need to learn that what happens on the ride stays on a ride but that's a different story right but you got to keep your cool i mean when something happens the first thing you want to do the first instinct is to go ballistic on the driver i get that i'm the worst offender of that okay but if there's an instance where you or someone with whom you are riding is the victim you don't want to by your being so aggressive you don't want to create a victim in that in that driver of that vehicle okay the first time I got hit by a car, it was this little old lady in a Buick, all right? I got creamed, and it was completely my fault. I 
saw a yellow light. I thought I could beat it through, and I didn't. And she hit me. Again, my fault. This was a lot of years ago, back when I didn't ride with a helmet, but I rode with a bandana around my freaking head. But uh, I got up. I pissed. I ripped my bike from underneath her car. I threw the bike against the side of the car, having no idea who it was. You know, dragged myself all bloody to the other side of the intersection. And then who climbs out of the car but this Prob- little woman, probably four foot eight, 85 years old. I mean, everybody's grandmother. The most kind hearted, sympathetic person in the world. And I'm there like an idiot screaming, okay? I did exactly what no one should do. I didn't keep my cool. And I went from being the victim to turning her into the victim. Now, the kid never went anywhere. I didn't sue anybody. Never, nothing ever happened of it. But God forbid that I needed to, to try to collect from that woman's insurance. Um, because I was seriously injured, or there was a lawsuit somehow when I was trying to get right, trying to protect the, my rights as a cyclist. Well, if my actions right after that, if I don't keep my cool, then I am just playing into the stereotype of jerk cyclists. Okay, so again, um, to the extent you can, try to keep your cool. Okay, rule number two is collect and save. All right. If you're in an accident with a dri- another driver, even if you think you're okay, if you go down, all right, if you crash, adrenaline kicks in before you even stand up. And that adrenaline is masking a whole hell of a lot of pain, number one. And number two, as cyclists, as triathletes, you are tougher than most people your age, all right? You have a pain tolerance that is infinitely higher than the person that's sitting on the couch doing absolutely nothing and never has, Okay but you're going to feel the effects of that accident, not right then, but later. Okay. You're, if you've got if you whiplash, sore back, those aren't going to kick in that day. Maybe not the next day. It might be two days later. Okay. So if you get in an accident you get not, and you go down, you get up, your tendency might be to say to the, to the driver, I'm fine. You're an asshole, but I'm fine. And send the, the driver on their way. Okay worst thing you can do because at that point you had an opportunity to identify the driver and you didn't do it so uh, i'll say it and say it again if you're in an accident document what happened get the driver's name take a picture you got a phone use it uh if your buddy goes down use your phone to take pictures for them get a picture of the license plate if you can get a picture of the driver um ask for their name their registration take pictures of it ask for their insurance card if especially in your, if you're in one of those states that doesn't have mandatory insurance, ask for them for their insurance card um, and, and, and take pictures of it, all right? If you can document the event, great. If you can take a picture of the scene of where it happened, excellent. If you can jot down a few notes, you know, just hit them, you know, dictate a, mo- a note into your phone that says what time it was, what the what the uh, the conditions of the road were like, what the lighting looked like, um, you know, what the weather was like. All of these things, it seems so simple. Well, I'm going to remember this down the road. No, you're not. You're not because your body immediately, when you're in an accident like this, your body immediately goes into preservation mode. Okay, and the same reason you're not feeling a heck of a lot of pain, your, your, your body is also triggering um, things in your brain where you're not going to remember every single detail. I mean, okay, if you're, if for those of you who are married and you've had an argument with your spouse or a long-term boyfriend, girlfriend, you've had an argument, you are absolutely certain, 100%, that you remember that argument one way. Well, your boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse or whomever is going to be absolutely certain that they re- recollect the, the conversation slightly different. And you're both just as positive as the other one that you're the right, you're in the right, that you remember it one way, not the way they do. Well, the reality is both of you are right and neither of you are because the human brain isn't going to remember every single detail in a heated event. The same with a car accident, but even more so, okay? The simple things like, what was the weather like? You might just have this memory in your head that it was pouring rain. It might have been sunny and beautiful, all right? So try to take some notes if you can, all right? And like I said, take pictures. Having the cell phone, the greatest thing you can do is to take as many pictures as you can. All right. Um, now, if you, again, if you're in an accident, you know, now we're talking about, you know, after you've, you know, you've, you've left the scene, you need to start thinking about documenting the damage. All right. You need to start thinking about 
what am I going to do? Because as an attorney who's helped people through scenarios like this, I'm trying to, I'm trying to recreate what happened to them and recreate what we call their damages or the, the, the injury that they've suffered. And when we start talking about those things so we can make a claim to the driver who was at fault for an accident, well, we, we're not just talking about the physical pain and suffering. That's only one very kind of, you know, the, a large, but only one component of, of the damage you suffer. Okay, if you go down hard, all right, on your head, your helmet, you can't use it again. The carbon components on your bike, chances are, are done, all right? Your, the clothes that you're wearing, nine times out of 10, they're ripped. Socks, sunglasses, shoes, we all know how expensive all that stuff is. So if those things are damaged at all, if they're torn, if they're wrecked, if your helmet has taken a blow, you got to take pictures of it. And I will tell anyone who's been in a serious accident, just save it all. Throw it in a box, throw it in your attic, throw it in your basement, wherever, and just save it, okay? Take a pair of shoes. You know, a pair of shoes can cost 500 bucks, right? Well, if someone says, yeah, I got in this, this wreck and my shoes got torn apart as I was skidding across the pavement, that's very, that, that happens not infrequently. Well, so what do they do? They throw the shoes away, they get new ones. Well, then I have to go back to the insurance company if I'm making a claim for this person and try to prove that these shoes were damaged. The insurance company is going to say to me, well, how the heck did the shoes get ruined in, a, in this accident when they went ass over tea kettle off their bike? They might not believe me. And how do I prove it if, you're, if you don't have pictures of the shoes or you don't have the shoes themselves? So just take the big question marks out of the equation. And if you're in a bike wreck and your kit, your helmet, sunglasses, shoes, socks, whatever it is, if it gets, if it gets scraped up, ding, dented, and you're not, it's, it can't be used anymore, again, throw it in a box and save it while you figure out whether you're going to make an insurance claim or not. All right. So um, identifying the witnesses. All right. So if there was anybody there, other cyclists, if you're in a big group ride, try to get someone to give you some names, uh, get some cell phone numbers of people. You know, easiest thing you can do is, if you know, if I'm in a group ride and I see there's been a wreck, it's caused by a car, the first thing I do is I try to take some control and I'll say to the group, listen, let me help you guys out. I'm an attorney. Just listen to me. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to start my phone on record and I'm just going to ask everyone to step up in front of me, tell me their name uh, and a phone number. I can, so we can reach them out later. And, you know, a few, a few people will get on their bike and ride away. They don't want to be involved. A few people will step up and do it. And that's great. Okay, then you've got it. And then if whoever was hurt, you can send it. You can get that information to them later. But then you've got it. You've helped out a friend. And hopefully if you're ever the victim, then someone is going to do that for you. Okay, because those witnesses, you know as well as I do, that if, you know, you make a claim against the driver, that driver is going to say, well, it wasn't my fault. Those damn cyclists, you know, they're out in the middle of the road or something like that, right? So that's what they're going to say. How do you combat that? You combat that with the photographs you have from the scene and the uh, testimony of the other cyclists of the other witnesses. All right. Contact an insurance company. So, um, and we'll get the insurance coming in a minute. Sorry, I don't want to go a little out of order, but we'll get the insurance in a second. The other thing is uh, rule number two of the accident, accident action strategy is to collect and save all the data. Okay, Strava, your Garmin, um, your watch, what, whatever you use to track your ride or your run, save that data. All right. If you need to go to Strava and ask them to make sure they save it, if you need to, to email it out to friends and family so they have copies, if you need to download it, whatever you can do, save it, save it, save it. Because that evidence, th that information is such good evidence to show where you were riding, the speed at which you were riding, and it shows where you were and that you, you didn't, as the, as the driver says, you swerved out in the middle of the road, your Garmin, if, if it's working right, sometimes Strava, uh, although not quite as, uh, as accurate down, to, down to, the, to the detail, but it will show where you were riding, right? It, it's going to show you are on the right-hand side of the road, not out in the middle of the road. So it's incredibly helpful information. Um, I had a case where I helped out a, a friend of mine, uh, a fellow QT tour, actually, who unfortunately got hurt pretty badly years ago. 
and his Garmin file was the greatest piece of evidence we had because it showed that he didn't swerve out in the middle of the road, number one, and we were able to pinpoint the exact moment the accident happened because, and the, the seconds before. We were able to show that he was out on a, a, on a very easy ride, a, a ZR ride, going like 14 miles an hour, and his speed was 14, 14, 14, and all of a sudden, in the course of like a third of a second, he goes from 14 to like 20 miles an hour, and then by the conclusion of one second, he's going 34 miles an hour, something like that. It's because he got hit and thrown. He got hit by a Jeep that was going like 50, okay? So we were able to sh show that, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, the world's greatest sprinter and it could accelerate at that level is because he got hit and thrown. We're also able to show that he was on the right-hand side of the road the whole time. Um, also, onboard uh, camera systems, um, you know, some people love them, some people hate them. I use it all the time, uh, whether you use a Cyclic, GoPro, there's a bunch of versions out there. You know, some people would say, well, maybe you don't use it because it's going to show if you do something wrong. Well, yeah, that's okay. If that's the case, so so be it. Then I'll, I'll take the hit on that one. But I think it's worthwhile having um, because it can – take any question out of the equation, right? Um, my brother-in-law lives out in Fort Collins, Colorado. That uh, that area, there's a ton of cyclists in the Fort Collins and Boulder area. He lives in Loveland, actually, but the Fort Collins County, I think is what it is. Anyway, the sheriff out there is notoriously anti-cyclist. Um, and there's a bunch of people out there who are anti-cyclist. So a lot of them use their cameras and they will constantly go home, download the video, send it off to the, a news uh, a news agency and send it to the police department and demand that they prosecute the driver. Uh, it's it's worthwhile. It's helped change the conversation in that town. It's helped change the dynamic. It's helped change people's views. So they're expensive, no question, um, but I think it's a worthy investment, both for you and, God forbid, worth it for your family if something were to happen, right? Okay, next, automobile insurance. Why the hell are we talking about automobile insurance uh, when we're talking about bike ride? Some of you might say this is a no-brainer. I know this. Some of you might say, what are you talking about? I know from personal experience that I, I, would, I would say the majority of cyclists and triathletes have no idea that if they have a car and they have automobile insurance or they live in a household of someone that has automobile insurance, that insurance policy will provide you some coverage, financial relief, if you are injured in an accident. Okay? So, the, re the rationale behind that is most cyclists, in, by, def by, by the insurance policies, you, you fall into the category of a pedestrian or someone walking. Okay? And so, the rules of, for pedestrians apply equally to cyclists. Some states have what's called no-fault insurance, which means that if you're, if you're struck by a driver, it doesn't matter if it's um, his fault or your fault or anyone's fault. If you're struck, their insurance will provide some coverage for you so for some of your medical bills, which is great. Okay, It also might provide, like in Massachusetts, some pain, some of your lost wages if you're, if you're out of work. All right? If, that, if it's a hit and run, well, your automobile insurance coverage might provide what's called PIP or no-fault coverage. Okay? Um, and it, typically that's for lost wages and medical bills, but it's something that's out there. And most people have no idea if you're on a bike that an automobile insurance, either of the person who hit you or your insurance or the insurance of someone you live with might provide you that coverage. Okay. The second thing is if you're in an accident with a, with an automobile and you're likely, you likely have a claim, what's called a bodily injury claim. Okay, it means you're hurt and you have a claim to recover for your injuries against the driver if they're the ones at fault. Their automobile insurance will is the one that will is the insurance company that would provide you some coverage. But and this is a huge one to remember. Okay, if the at fault driver is not insured, okay, if they're unlicensed in some sometimes, if the vehicle's not registered, or if it's a hit and run and so you don't know what who, who the driver was. Some people, and I have friends that this happened to, and I wish they'd come talk to me earlier because I could have helped them out. 
they think, oh, I'm just shit out of luck because I don't know who the car was or the car that hit me was uninsured. Well, if you have automobile insurance yourself or you live with someone who does, that policy usually provides what's called uninsured motorist coverage. That uninsured motorist coverage protects you. It says that if you were involved in, a, in an accident as a pedestrian, which cyclists are considered in, under most insurance policies, and that vehicle that caused the accident can't be identified or was uninsured, then your insurance policy steps in and pays you, and it pays you for the, the injuries, physical and sometimes mental injuries that you will have suffered, all right? That's huge. So I'm going to take a step aside and say every single one of you, if you take, can take five minutes over the next couple of days, figure out where you get your automobile insurance, whether you go through an agent or you buy it direct off the Internet, whatever you do, call your agent, call your broker, call your insurance company directly and say, what are my uninsured motorist coverage limits and how do I increase them? Okay, you can have none. You could have what's called 100,000 in coverage. You could have 250,000 in coverage. You could have 500,000 in coverage. Whatever you have, get the most you can get. Because if you're out on the road training for an Ironman, then I know, because I've been through it so many times, that you're out on the road for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And that's just on a Saturday, right? Okay? Not to mention the rest of the week. What little it will cost you to increase your coverage limits is an investment that if you're ever in an accident and it's a hit and run, it'll pay you, it's there for you, okay? I, I, I'm not sponsored by an insurance company. I wish I could get one of them to sponsor this presentation, and pay, you know, but that's not the way it is. But if you go to them, ask, tell them you want to increase your limits because it's going to pay you dividends, okay? Um, in most states, uninsured motorist coverage, in, most, in a lot of states, it's optional coverage, which means you don't have to buy it, so you can't assume that you have it. You need to go and, um, and, and make sure, just check and make sure that you have it, okay? All right, I'm just checking the questions box real quick. I don't see any questions. I don't think, all right, I don't see anything in the chat, so that means you're bored out of your mind or no one's got questions so far. That's cool, great, okay. So next, um, Kind of like uninsured motorist coverage, in many states where there is mandatory insurance, like Massachusetts, the mandatory limits are very, very low. They're called mandatory minimums. I'm not talking about federal sentencing guidelines. I'm talking about auto insurance, right? So they're, and they're very small. In Massachusetts, it's, it's $20,000 in coverage per person in, um, in an accident, right? So it's not a lot of money when you think about it if you have a broken leg and your bike's total, right? It's not a lot to cover you. So... You have the option through your own automobile insurance to call, purchase what's called underinsured motorist coverage. So what that means is, say you're in an accident and the other vehicle has very, very low insurance limits, okay? And that insurance is not enough to, to really pay you for your injuries. So if that driver is at fault, usually, even after a fight, usually that insurance company will pay you the low limits of insurance they have for that driver. Where do you go next? Now, unfortunately, most drivers, they, they're not sitting on a pot of gold, they're not billionaires, um, it's, and, and if they're billionaires, they don't have low limits of insurance, okay? If they're billionaires, they have lots of insurance. So if you get hit some, by someone who has very, very low insurance, well, probably they're not sitting on a couple million in the bank, right? If they don't have enough insurance to pay you for your injuries, you can then go back to your own insurance company and say, this guy wrecked me. The driver didn't have enough insurance, so I want to make a claim under my underinsured motorist coverage. So again, going back to one of the rules in the accident um, uh, strategy, the accident action strategy, excuse me, notify the insurance company. Notify your own insurance company just so they know. Notify the insurance company, the driver, if you know who it is that you've been in an accident, just so they know. Because insurance companies have a rule that if you don't tell them about an accident soon enough, they can deny a claim, okay? Because they have a right to only pay out claims that they know are legitimate. They don't want people coming up two years later and saying, well, oh, yeah, I forgot about it. I was in an accident two years ago. Pay me some money. They're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? No. You have to do it soon. In many states, if you're in a hit-and-run situation, so you don't know who the other vehicle is, 
in many states, you're required to notify your insurance company within 24 hours, okay? So think about that. You're in an accident on a Saturday morning during your, you know, your, your five-hour Z1 ride. You get in an accident. You're supposed to notify your insurance company by Sunday morning, all right? So that's why. So don't take a chance. If you're in an accident, after you've called the police, after you've collected the evidence, when you get home, call your insurance company. Now, of course, if you're injured and you're in a hospital and you can't call, then there's going to be exceptions. But if you have the ability to make a call, do it. Even if you just do a partial report, you don't tell them everything, just let them know you were injured in an accident, then at least you put them on notice and you've satisfied that. So you got to do it. Okay. So uninsured motorist coverage is going to, pro uh, is going to provide you a benefit if it's a hit and run, you don't know the car, or if the car is not insured or not registered or stolen, something like that. If the vehicle doesn't have enough insurance, underinsured motorist coverage is what's going to provide you the benefit, right? Okay. So, again, when you're, we're done this, I know all of you are going to grab your insurance policies, you're going to call your agent, and you're going to say, how do I increase my uninsured and my underinsured motorist coverage? Because it's worth doing. Um, most states are also allowed to purchase medical payments coverage. That's a bit more of a question mark because the interplay between medical uh, payment coverage and your automobile insurance, and if you have health insurance, the interplay between those two things can be convoluted. So, and medical payment coverage sometimes is, is expensive. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it comes free. But um, it's worth having a conversation with your agent or your insurance company about whether it's something you want to get. Um, all right. So again, the lesson for insurance, the thing don't forget is to purchase high limits. And if you don't know what your limits are, go find out and try to increase them if you can. The other thing about insurance is the location matters. Okay, Here in Massachusetts, by way of example, if I only have the most bare bones automobile insurance and I'm on my bike and I get hit by a car up in New Hampshire or any place outside of Massachusetts, there's a very good chance that whatever little insurance I have that might have covered me, it's not going to cover me when an accident happens outside of Mass. However, if I do purchase that, what's called that optional insurance, underinsured or uninsured motorist coverage, I, that insurance will provide me coverage outside of Massachusetts. Okay? So, uh, we've talked today and I'm just to the point, kind of wrapping up here. Um, we've talked today about kind of knowing the rules of the road. Like I said, I, I, I could probably speak for six hours alone on the various rules in different states. Um, obviously, that's not possible, so I want to kind of give you Massachusetts as an example. Um, if you have questions, l learn what your state's rules are, okay? It's worth 10 minutes of your time. Open a beer. Uh, don't tell Jesse I said that, but open a beer, Google it, take a dig around a little bit, um, or give me a call. I'm happy to try to happy to look at it, take a look at it, and at least point you in the right direction. That's the least I can do. Um, just give me, again, shoot me an email, give me a shout. Um, know your rights as a cyclist, but don't assume that everybody else does. Okay, riding two abreast might be legal in a lot of states, but doing so when it creates a dangerous situation is just dumb, no matter how how you cut it. All right. It's imperative that in the event of an accident, the last thing you want to do is collect information, but it's imperative that you do. Collect as much information as you can. Um, it's going to be worth its weight in gold if you need to make a claim, if you've been out of work, if you can't work anymore, if you've lost wages, if you lost entry fees for races, if, you've been, if you can't train, if your bike's wrecked. I mean, the way you get compensated for those things, and I'm not, I'm not advocating that we run out and sue everybody. That's, that's, that's not what I'm trying to say, but if you need some protection, that's what insurance is for, but you need to be able to prove what happened. You need to document it. Um, use lights, use video recording lights if you want. Uh, just remember they can work against you. So if you're gonna do it, do the right thing when you're riding. And then by purchasing additional levels of insurance, you can protect yourself financially and protect your family, all right? It's, it's, uh, automobile insurance can be adding those additional levels is a cheap way to make sure you're protected. So again, that's about it. Uh, I hope this was informative. I uh, hope it was helpful. I can't say enough. Just reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, if any of you are unfortunately in an accident, if you're not, this, 
feel free to reach out, ask me some, for some help of what to do. You know, I don't charge for any of that. I just provided advice, happy to do it. If, and if you need an attorney someplace, I'm happy to, to find an attorney for you. If I'm able to help you out, I'm happy to do it. But um, I've, uh, and if, if you have an attorney or you're in an accident and you already represented and you have questions about what's going on, you know, I can kind of steer you in the right direction. But, you know, I want to make sure that we avoid accidents. But if they do happen, I want to make sure that people are able to protect themselves. So, again, thank you so much. Thanks for attending. Uh, again, I don't see any questions here, really. I see Lincoln's calling Liberty Mutual tomorrow. Excellent. Great move. Um, let's see here. Let's see. I can't scroll up and see the question. So I'm not, if someone's asking a question, I apologize. Um, I can't see what the questions are. What I'm going to do super fast here. I don't know if I think I can unmute everyone. I just unmuted everybody for a second. Um, so feel free to chime in with any questions. Oh, I can't unmute you, so I lied. It's not working. So anyway, you have my email. Shoot me an email. Give me a call. And everybody be safe out on the roads. Take care. And uh, I hope everyone stays happy, healthy, and we're back to racing in no time. Thank you. Take care.